This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Paul Adams. Part 2 about this time great disturbances arose in Rome, owing to the dearness of living which was caused by the absence of the pontiff at Avignon. The German governor, Enrico, was much blamed for what happened, murders and tumults following each other daily, without his being able to put an end to them. This caused Enrico much anxiety, lest the Romans should call in Roberto, the king of Naples, who would drive the Germans out of the city and bring back the Pope. Having no nearer friend to whom he could apply for help than Castruccio, he sent to him, begging him not only to give him assistance, but also to come in person to Rome. Castruccio considered that he ought not to hesitate to render the emperor this service, because he believed that he himself would not be safe if at any time the emperor ceased to hold Rome. Leaving Pagolo Guinigi in command at Lucca, Castruccio set out for Rome with six hundred horsemen, where he was received by Enrico with the greatest distinction. In a short time the presence of Castruccio obtained such respect for the emperor that, without bloodshed or violence, good order was restored, chiefly by reason of Castruccio having sent by sea from the country round Pisa large quantities of corn, and thus removed the source of the trouble. When he had chastised some of the Roman leaders, and admonished others, voluntary obedience was rendered to Enrico. Castruccio received many honours, and was made a Roman senator. This dignity was assumed with the greatest pomp, Castruccio being clothed in a brocaded toga, which had the following words embroidered on its front, I am what God wills whilst on the back was what God desires shall be. During this time the Florentines, who were much enraged that Castruccio should have seized Pistoia during the truce, considered how they could tempt the city to rebel, to do which they thought would not be difficult in his absence. Among the exiled Pistoians in Florence were Baldo Cecchi and Jacopo Baldini, both men of leading and ready to face danger. These men kept up communications with their friends in Pistoia, and with the aid of the Florentines entered the city by night and after driving out some of Castruccio's officials and partisans, and killing others, they restored the city to its freedom. The news of this greatly angered Castruccio, and taking leave of Enrico, he pressed on in great haste to Pistoia. When the Florentines heard of his return, knowing that he would lose no time, they decided to intercept him with their forces in the Val di Nievole, under the belief that by doing so they would cut off his road to Pistoia. Assembling a great army of the supporters of the Guelph cause, the Florentines entered the Pistoian territories. On the other hand, Castruccio reached Monte Carlo with his army, and having heard where the Florentines lay, he decided not to encounter it in the plains of Pistoia, nor to await it in the plains of Pescia, but as far as he possibly could, to attack it boldly in the pass of Serravale. He believed that if he succeeded in this design, victory was assured, although he was informed that the Florentines had thirty thousand men, whilst he had only twelve thousand. Although he had every confidence in his own abilities and the valour of his troops, yet he hesitated to attack his enemy in the open, lest he should be overwhelmed by numbers. Serravale is a castle between Pescia and Pistoia, situated on a hill which blocks the Val di Nievole, not in the exact pass, but about a bowshot beyond.
The pass itself is in places narrow and steep, whilst in general it ascends gently, but is still narrow, especially at the summit where the waters divide, so that twenty men side by side could hold it. The lord of Serra Valle was Manfred, a German who, before Castruccio became lord of Pistoia, had been allowed to remain in possession of the castle, it being common to the Lucchese and the Pistoians and unclaimed by either, neither of them wishing to displace Manfred as long as he kept his promise of neutrality and came under obligations to no one. For these reasons, and also because the castle was well fortified, he had always been able to maintain his position. It was here that Castruccio had determined to fall upon his enemy, for here his few men would have the advantage, and there was no fear, lest, seeing the large masses of the hostile force before they became engaged, they should not stand. As soon as this trouble with Florence arose, Castruccio saw the immense advantage which possession of this castle would give him, and having an intimate friendship with the resident in the castle, he managed matters so with him that four hundred of his men were to be admitted into the castle the night before the attack on the Florentines, and the castellan put to death. Castruccio, having prepared everything, had now to encourage the Florentines to persist in their desire to carry the seat of war away from Pistoia into the Val di Nievole. Therefore, he did not move his army from Monte Carlo. Thus the Florentines hurried on until they reached their encampment under Serra Valle, intending to cross the hill on the following morning. In the meantime, Castruccio had seized the castle at night, had also moved his army from Monte Carlo, and, marching from thence at midnight in dead silence, had reached the foot of Serra Valle. Thus, he and the Florentines commenced the ascent of the hill at the same time in the morning. Castruccio sent forward his infantry by the main road, and a troop of four hundred horsemen by a path on the left towards the castle. The Florentines sent forward four hundred cavalry ahead of their army, which was following, never expecting to find Castruccio in possession of the hill, nor were they aware of his having seized the castle. Thus it happened that the Florentine horsemen mounting the hill were completely taken by surprise when they discovered the infantry of Castruccio, and so close were they upon it they had scarcely time to pull down their their visors. It was a case of unready soldiers being attacked by ready, and they were assailed with such vigour that with difficulty they could hold their own, although some few of them got through. When the noise of the fighting reached the Florentine camp below, it was filled with confusion. The cavalry and infantry became inextricably mixed. The captains were unable to get their men either backward or forward, owing to the narrowness of the pass and amid all this tumult no one knew what ought to be done or what could be done. In a short time the cavalry who were engaged with the enemy's infantry were scattered or killed without having made any effective defence because of their unfortunate position, although in sheer desperation they had offered a stout resistance. Retreat had been impossible with the mountains on both flanks, whilst in front were their enemies and in the rear their friends. When Castruccio saw that his men were unable to strike a decisive blow at the enemy and put them to flight, he sent one thousand infantrymen round by the castle with orders to join the four hundred horsemen he had previously dispatched there and commanded the whole force to fall upon the flank of the enemy. These orders they carried out with such fury that the Florentines could not sustain the attack, but gave way, and were soon in full retreat, conquered more by their unfortunate position than by the valour of their enemy. Those in the rear turned towards Pistoia, and spread through the plains, each man seeking only his own safety.
The defeat was complete and very sanguinary. Many captains were taken prisoners, among whom were Bandini dei Rossi, Francesco Brunelleschi, and Giovanni della Tosa, all Florentine noblemen, with many Tuscans and Neapolitans who fought on the Florentine side, having been sent by King Ruberto to assist the Guelphs. Immediately the Pistoians heard of this defeat, they drove out the friends of the Guelphs and surrendered to Castruccio. He was not content with occupying Prato and all the castles on the plains on both sides of the Arno, but marched his army into the plain of Peratola, about two miles from Florence. Here he remained many days, dividing the spoils and celebrating his victory with feasts and games, holding horse-races and foot-races for men and women. He also struck medals in commemoration of the defeat of the Florentines. He endeavoured to corrupt some of the citizens of Florence, who were to open the city gates at night, but the conspiracy was discovered, and the participators in it taken and beheaded, among whom were Tommaso Lupacci and Lambertuccio Frescobaldi. This defeat caused the Florentines great anxiety, and despairing of preserving their liberty, they sent envoys to King Roberto of Naples, offering him the dominion of their city, and he, knowing of what immense importance the maintenance of the Guelf cause was to him, accepted it. He agreed with the Florentines to receive from them a yearly tribute of two hundred thousand florins, and he sent his son Carlo to Florence with four thousand horsemen. Shortly after this the Florentines were relieved in some degree of the pressure of Castruccio's army, owing to his being compelled to leave his positions before Florence and march on Pisa in order to suppress a conspiracy that had been raised against him by Benedetto Lanfranchi, one of the first men in Pisa, who could not endure that his fatherland should be under the dominion of the Lucchese. He had formed this conspiracy, intending to seize the citadel, kill the partisans of Castruccio, and drive out the garrison. As, however, in a conspiracy, paucity of numbers is essential to secrecy, so for its execution a few are not sufficient, and in seeking more adherence to his conspiracy, Lanfranchi encountered a person who revealed the design to Castruccio. This betrayal cannot be passed by without severe reproach to Bonifacio Cerchi and Giovanni Guidi, two Florentine exiles who were suffering their banishment in Pisa. Thereupon Castruccio seized Benedetto and put him to death, and beheaded many other noble citizens, and drove their families into exile. It now appeared to Castruccio that both Pisa and Pistoia were thoroughly disaffected. He employed much thought and energy upon securing his position there, and this gave the Florentines their opportunity to reorganize their army and to await the coming of Carlo, the son of the King of Naples. When Carlo arrived, they decided to lose no more time, and assembled a great army of more than 30,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry, having called to their aid every Guelph there was in Italy. They consulted whether they should attack Pistoia or Pisa first, and decided that it would be better to march on the latter, a course, owing to their recent conspiracy, more likely to succeed, and of more advantage to them, because they believed that the surrender of Pistoia would follow the acquisition of Pisa. In the early part of May 1328, the Florentines put in motion this army, and quickly occupied Lastra, Signa, Montelupo, and Empoli, passing from thence on to San Miniato. 
when castruccio heard of the enormous army which the florentines were sending against him he was in no degree alarmed believing that the time had now arrived when fortune would deliver the empire of tuscany into his hands for he had no reason to think that his enemy would make a better fight or had better prospects of success than at pisa or serravale he assembled twenty thousand foot soldiers and four thousand horsemen and with this army went to fucecchio whilst he sent pagolo guanigi to pisa with five thousand infantry fucecchio has a stronger position than any other town in the pisan district owing to its situation between the rivers arno and gusciana and its slight elevation above the surrounding plain moreover the enemy could not hinder its being victualled unless they divided their forces nor could they approach it either from the direction of lucca or pisa nor could they get through to pisa or attack castruccio's forces except at a disadvantage in one case they would find themselves placed between his two armies the one under his command and the other under pagolo and in the other case they would have to cross the arno to get to close quarters with the enemy an undertaking of great hazard in order to tempt the florentines to take this latter course castruccio withdrew his men from the banks of the river and placed them under the walls of fucecchio leaving a wide expanse of land between them and the river the florentines having occupied san miniato held a council of war to decide whether they should attack pisa or the army of castruccio and having weighed the difficulties of both courses they decided upon the latter the river arno was at that time low enough to be fordable yet the water reached to the shoulders of the infantrymen and to the saddles of the horsemen on the morning of ten june thirteen twenty eight the florentines commenced the battle by ordering forward a number of cavalry and ten thousand infantry castruccio whose plan of action was fixed and who well knew what to do at once attacked the florentines with five thousand infantry and three thousand horsemen not allowing them to issue from the river before he charged them he also sent one thousand light infantry up the river bank and the same number down the arno the infantry of the florentines were so much impeded by their arms and the water that they were not able to mount the banks of the river whilst the cavalry had made the passage of the river more difficult for the others by reason of the few who had crossed having broken up the bed of the river and this being deep with mud many of the horses rolled over with their riders and many of them had stuck so fast that they could not move when the florentine captains saw the difficulties their men were meeting they withdrew them and moved higher up the river hoping to find the river bed less treacherous and the banks more adapted for landing these men were met at the bank by the forces which castruccio had already sent forward who being light armed with bucklers and javelins in their hands let fly with tremendous shouts into the faces and bodies of the cavalry the horses alarmed by the noise and the wounds would not move forward and trampled each other in great confusion the fight between the men of castruccio and those of the enemy who succeeded in crossing was sharp and terrible both sides fought with the utmost desperation and neither would yield the soldiers of castruccio fought to drive the others back into the river whilst the florentines strove to get a footing on land in order to make room for the others pressing forward who if they could but get out of the water would be able to fight and in this obstinate conflict they were urged on by their captains castruccio shouted to his men that these were the same enemies whom they had before conquered at serravale whilst the florentines reproached each other that the many should be overcome by the few 
At length, Castruccio, seeing how long the battle had lasted, and that both his men and the enemy were utterly exhausted, and that both sides had many killed and wounded, pushed forward another body of infantry to take up a position at the rear of those who were fighting. He then commanded these latter to open their ranks, as if they intended to retreat, and one part of them to turn to the right, and another to the left. This cleared a space of which the Florentines at once took advantage, and thus gained possession of a portion of the battlefield. But when these tired soldiers found themselves at close quarters with Castruccio's reserves, they could not stand against them, and at once fell back into the river. The cavalry of either side had not as yet gained any decisive advantage over the other, because Castruccio, knowing his inferiority in this arm, had commanded his leaders only to stand on the defensive against the attacks of their adversaries, as he hoped that when he had overcome the infantry he would be able to make short work of the cavalry. This fell out as he had hoped, for when he saw the Florentine army driven back across the river, he ordered the remainder of his infantry to attack the cavalry of the enemy. This they did with lance and javelin, and, joined by their own cavalry, fell upon the enemy with the greatest fury, and soon put him to flight." The Florentine captains, having seen the difficulty their cavalry had met with in crossing the river, had attempted to make their infantry cross lower down the river, in order to attack the flanks of Castruccio's army. But here, also, the banks were steep and already lined by the men of Castruccio, and this movement was quite useless. Thus the Florentines were so completely defeated at all points that scarcely a third of them escaped, and Castruccio was again covered with glory. Many captains were taken prisoners, and Carlo, the son of King Roberto, with Michelagnolo Falcone and Taddeo degli Albizzi, the Florentine commissioners, fled to Empoli. If the spoils were great, the slaughter was infinitely greater, as might be expected in such a battle. Of the Florentines there fell 20,231 men, whilst Castruccio lost 1,570 men. But fortune, growing envious of the glory of Castruccio, took away his life just at the time when she should have preserved it, and thus ruined all those plans which for so long a time he had worked to carry into effect, and in the successful prosecution of which nothing but death could have stopped him. Castruccio was in the thick of the battle the whole of the day, and when the end of it came, although fatigued and overheated, he stood at the gate of Fucecchio to welcome his men on their return from victory, and personally thank them. He was also on the watch for any attempt of the enemy to retrieve the fortunes of the day, he being of the opinion that it was the duty of a good general to be the first man in the saddle and the last out of it. Here Castruccio stood exposed to a wind, which often rises at midday on the banks of the Arno, and which is often very unhealthy. From this he took a chill, of which he thought nothing, as he was accustomed to such troubles, but it was the cause of his death. On the following night he was attacked with high fever, which increased so rapidly that the doctors saw it must prove fatal. Castruccio, therefore, called Pagolo Guinigi to him, and addressed him as follows. If I could have believed that fortune would have cut me off in the midst of the career which was leading to that glory which all my successes promised, I should have laboured less, and I should have left thee, if a small estate, at least with fewer enemies and perils, because I should have been content with the governorships of Lucca and Pisa. I should neither have subjugated the Pistoians, nor outraged the Florentines with so many injuries. 
but I would have made both these peoples my friends, and I should have lived, if no longer, at least more peacefully, and have left you a state without a doubt smaller, but one more secure, and established on a surer foundation. But fortune, who insists upon having the arbitrament of human affairs, did not endow me with sufficient judgment to recognize this from the first, nor the time to surmount it. Thou hast heard, for many have told thee, and I have never concealed it, how I entered the house of thy father whilst yet a boy, a stranger to all those ambitions which every generous soul should feel, and how I was brought up by him, and loved as though I had been born of his blood. How, under his governance, I learned to be valiant and capable of availing myself of all that fortune of which thou hast been witness. When thy good father came to die, he committed thee and all his possessions to my care, and I have brought thee up with that love, and increased thy estate with that care which I was bound to show." and in order that thou shouldst not only possess the estate which thy father left but also that which my fortune and abilities have gained i have never married so that the love of children should never deflect my mind from that gratitude which i owed to the children of thy father Thus I leave thee a vast estate, of which I am well content, but I am deeply concerned, inasmuch as I leave it thee unsettled and insecure. Thou hast the city of Lucca on thy hands, which will never rest contented under thy government. Thou hast also Pisa, where the men are of nature changeable and unreliable, who, although they may be sometimes held in subjection, yet they will ever disdain to serve under a Lucchese. Pistoia is also disloyal to thee, she being eaten up with factions, and deeply incensed against thy family by reason of the wrongs recently inflicted upon them. Thou hast for neighbours the offended Florentines, injured by us in a thousand ways, but not utterly destroyed, who will hail the news of my death with more delight than they would the acquisition of all Tuscany. In the Emperor and in the Princes of Milan thou canst place no reliance, for they are far distant, slow, and their help is very long in coming." Therefore thou hast no hope in anything but in thine own abilities, and in the memory of my valour, and in the prestige which this latest victory has brought thee, which, as thou knowest how to use it with prudence, will assist thee to come to terms with the Florentines, who, as they are suffering under this great defeat, should be inclined to listen to thee. And whereas I have sought to make them my enemies, because I believe that war with them would conduce to my power and glory, thou hast every inducement to make friends of them, because their alliance will bring thee advantages and security. It is of the greatest importance in this world that a man should know himself, and the measure of his own strength and means, and he who knows that he has not a genius for fighting must learn how to govern by the arts of peace. And it will be well for thee to rule thy conduct by my counsel, and to learn in this way to enjoy what my life-work and dangers have gained, and in this thou wilt easily succeed when thou hast learnt to believe that what I have told thee is true, and thou wilt be doubly indebted to me, in that I have left thee this realm, and have taught thee how to keep it. After this there came to Castruccio those citizens of Pisa, Pistoia, and Lucca who had been fighting at his side, and whilst recommending Pagolo to them, and making them swear obedience to him as a successor, he died. He left a happy memory to those who had known him, and no prince of those times was ever loved with such devotion as he was. His obsequies were celebrated with every sign of mourning, and he was buried in San Francesco at Lucca, 
Fortune was not so friendly to Bergolo Guinigi as she had been to Castruccio, for he had not the abilities. Not long after the death of Castruccio, Pergolo lost Pisa, and then Pistoia, and only with difficulty held on to Luca. This latter city continued in the family of Guinigi until the time of the great-grandson of Pergolo. From what has been related here, it will be seen that Castruccio was a man of exceptional abilities, not only measured by men of his own time, but also by those of an earlier date. In stature he was above the ordinary height, and perfectly proportioned. He was of a gracious presence, and he welcomed men with such urbanity that those who spoke with him rarely left him displeased. His hair was inclined to be red, and he wore it cut short above the ears, and whether it rained or snowed, he always went without a hat. He was delightful among friends, but terrible to his enemies, just to his subjects, ready to play false with the unfaithful, and willing to overcome by fraud those whom he desired to subdue, because he was wont to say that it was the victory that brought the glory, not the methods of achieving it. No one was bolder in facing danger, none more prudent in extricating himself. He was accustomed to say that men ought to attempt everything and fear nothing, that God is a lover of strong men, because one always sees that the weak are chastised by the strong. He was also wonderfully sharp or biting, though courteous in his answers, and as he did not look for any indulgence in this way of speaking from others, so he was not angered if others did not show it to him. It has often happened that he has listened quietly when others have spoken sharply to him, as on the following occasions. He had caused a ducat to be given for a partridge, and was taken to task for doing so by a friend, to whom Castruccio had said, You would not have given more than a penny. That is true, answered the friend. Then said Castruccio to him, A ducat is much less to me. Having about him a flatterer, on whom he had spat to show that he scorned him, the flatterer said to him, Fishermen are willing to let the waters of the sea saturate them, in order that they may take a few little fishes, and I allow myself to be wetted by spittle, that I may catch a whale. And this was not only heard by Castruccio with patience, but rewarded. When told by a priest that it was wicked for him to live so sumptuously, Castruccio said, If that be a vice, then you should not fare so splendidly at the feasts of our saints. Passing through a street, he saw a young man, as he came out of a house of ill fame, blush at being seen by Castruccio, and said to him, Thou shouldst not be ashamed when thou comest out, but when thou goest into such places. A friend gave him a very curiously tied knot to undo, and was told, Fool, do you think that I wish to untie a thing which gave so much trouble to fasten? Castruccio said to one who professed to be a philosopher, You are like the dogs who always run after those who will give them the best to eat, and was answered, We are rather like the doctors who go to the houses of those who have the greatest need of them. Going by water from Pisa to Leghorn, Castruccio was much disturbed by a dangerous storm that sprang up, and was reproached for cowardice by one of those with him, who said that he did not fear anything. Castruccio answered that he did not wonder at that, since every man valued his soul for what it was worth. Being asked by one what he ought to do to gain estimation, he said, When thou goest to a banquet, take care that thou dost not seat one piece of wood upon another. To a person who was boasting that he had read many things, Castruccio said, He knows better than to boast of remembering many things. Someone bragged that he could drink much without becoming intoxicated. 
Castruccio replied, an ox does the same. Castruccio was acquainted with a girl with whom he had had intimate relations, and being blamed by a friend who told him that it was undignified for him to be taken in by a woman, he said, She has not taken me in, I have taken her. Being also blamed for eating very dainty foods, he answered, Thou dost not spend as much as I do? And being told that it was true, he continued, Then thou art more avaricious than I am gluttonous. Being invited by Taddeo Bernardi, a very rich and splendid citizen of Lucca, to supper, he went to the house, and was shown by Taddeo into a chamber hung with silk, and paved with fine stones representing flowers and foliage of the most beautiful colouring. Castruccio gathered some saliva in his mouth, and spat it out upon Taddeo, and seeing him much disturbed by this, said to him, I knew not where to spit in order to offend thee less. Being asked how Caesar died, he said, God willing, I will die as he did. Being one night in the house of one of his gentlemen, where many ladies were assembled, he was reproved by one of his friends for dancing and amusing himself with them more than was usual in one of his station. So he said, He who is considered wise by day will not be considered a fool at night. A person came to demand a favour of Castruccio, and thinking he was not listening to his plea, threw himself on his knees to the ground, and being sharply reproved by Castruccio, said, Thou art the reason of my acting thus, for thou hast thy ears in thy feet, whereupon he obtained double the favour he had asked. Castruccio used to say that the way to hell was an easy one, seeing that it was in a downward direction, and you travelled blindfolded. Being asked a favour by one who used many superfluous words, he said to him, When you have another request to make, send someone else to make it. Having been wearied by a similar man with a long oration, who wound up by saying, Perhaps I have fatigued you by speaking so long, Castruccio said, You have not, because I have not listened to a word you said. He used to say of one who had been a beautiful child, and who afterwards became a fine man, that he was dangerous, because he first took the husbands from the wives, and now he took the wives from their husbands. To an envious man who laughed, he said, Do you laugh because you are successful, or because another is unfortunate? Whilst he was still in the charge of Messer Francesco Guinigi, one of his companions said to him, What shall I give you if you will let me give you a blow on the nose? Castruccio answered, A helmet. Having put to death a citizen of Lucca, who had been instrumental in raising him to power, and being told that he had done wrong to kill one of his old friends, he answered that people deceived themselves. He had only killed a new enemy. Castruccio praised greatly those men who intended to take a wife, and then did not do so, saying that they were like men who said they would go to sea, and then refused when the time came. He said that it always struck him with surprise, that whilst men in buying an earthen or glass vase would sound it first to learn if it were good, yet in choosing a wife they were content with only looking at her. He was once asked in what manner he would wish to be buried when he died, and answered, With the face turned downward, for I know when I am gone this country will be turned upside down. On being asked if it had ever occurred to him to become a friar in order to save his soul, he answered that it had not, because it appeared strange to him that Fra Lasseroni should go to paradise, and Ugaccioni della Fagiola to the inferno. He was once asked, When should a man eat to preserve his health? and replied, if a man be rich, let him eat when he is hungry. If he be poor, then when he can. 
Seeing one of his gentlemen make a member of his family lace him up, he said to him, I pray God that you will let him feed you also. Seeing that someone had written upon his house in Latin the words, May God preserve this house from the wicked, he said, The owner must never go in. Passing through one of the streets, he saw a small house with a very large door, and remarked, That house will fly through the door. He was having a discussion with the ambassador of the King of Naples concerning the property of some banished nobles when a dispute arose between them, and the ambassador asked him if he had no fear of the king. "'Is this king of yours a bad man or a good one?' asked Castruccio, and was told that he was a good one, whereupon he said, "'Why should you suggest that I should be afraid of a good man?' I could recount many other stories of his sayings, both witty and weighty, but I think that the above will be sufficient testimony to his high qualities. He lived forty-four years, and was in every way a prince. And as he was surrounded by many evidences of his good fortune, so he also desired to have near him some memorials of his bad fortune. Therefore the manacles with which he was chained in prison are to be seen to this day fixed up in the tower of his residence, where they were placed by him to testify for ever to his days of adversity." As in his life he was inferior neither to Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander, nor to Scipio of Rome, so he died in the same year of his age as they did, and he would doubtless have excelled both of them, had fortune decreed that he should be born not in Lucca, but in Macedonia or Rome. End of the Life of Castruccio Castracani of Luca, Part 2 End of the Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, translated by William K. Marriott Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com